Well, thank you so much, Molly. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing Wellbeing series. We're delighted to be hosting as our well-being speaker today, Susan Magsiman, who will be sharing her presentation titled, Your Brain on Art, How the Arts Transform Us. And it's most fitting that we're holding this lecture in April, the month designated as National Poetry Month, the celebration of one type of the arts. There's a growing interest in the intersection between the arts and healing, a new field of study, the neuroarts examines how the arts and aesthetic experiences measurably change the brain and body and how this knowledge is translated into practices that advance health and well-being. The arts in this context include music, poetry, dance, visual art, and immersive art experiences that are often a combination of aesthetic experiences. While the Bakken Center has been committed for many years to exploring arts and healing, the new field of neuroarts offers many exciting new opportunities for us. I truly believe that we're on the verge of a cultural shift in which it's more deeply understood that the arts can deliver potent, accessible, and proven solutions in support of well being for all. Today's free lecture is made possible through the generosity of our university donors and individual donors. Thank you for your commitment to the health and well-being of people in Minnesota and around the world. It's now my honor to introduce our speaker today. Susan Magsiman is the founder and executive director of the International Arts Plus Mind Lab, the Center for Applied Neuroaesthetics, a pioneering neuroaesthetics initiative from the Peterson Brain Science Institute at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Susan's work focuses on how the arts and aesthetic experiences measurably change the brain, body, and behavior, and how this knowledge can be translated to inform health and well being and learning programs in medicine, public health, and education. In addition to her role at the IAM lab, Susan is also the co director of the NeuroArts Blueprint Project in partnership with the Aspen Institute. The Blueprint aims to create the field of neuroarts where arts and aesthetics are mainstream in medicine and public health. Susan is also the, the co-author of the New York Times bestseller, Your Brain on Art, How the Arts Transform Us, a book that's been written for the general public. Welcome, Susan. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here. And as I'm watching the chat, I'm seeing people I know, which I love. So hello, everyone and also seeing people from all over the world. So it's really quite an honor to um, have this opportunity to talk with you today. And I'm looking forward to sharing some of the information and work that we've been doing and a bit about the science of, of neuroaesthetics and then also um, spending some time talking with Mary Jo. So let me see if I can go ahead and get my slides up and we'll get started. do this correctly here. Okay, let me see. All right, I think we're good to go. So um, again, I just would like to thank everyone for inviting me to be part of this um, this conversation. I, I, I'm really so thrilled to, to talk with you and to, to hear more about what you're doing as well. So um, as Mary Jo said, I am the director of the International Arts and Mind Lab, Center for Applied Neuroaesthetics. And we really are an incredibly interdisciplinary program that its mis our mission is really to amplify human potential through the arts and aesthetic experiences. And we had a donor um, that really started this work for us in 2007 when um, she asked, uh, if we'd be interested in studying the arts, she believed that the arts could save us. And if you can imagine, I'm in a medical school and the idea of the arts in a medical school seemed quite a bit like oil and water, but we had a Dean and a president who really thought that there was something about this that we needed to explore. And so I often start my, my conversations by talking about Marilyn Peterson, who the 
Brain, Brain Science Institute is named after her family. And she was the visionary for this work and really continues to be the person that really, I think, has been driving this idea. And now we're seeing it all over the world. So let me just make sure I can move this slide forward. There we go. So just to level set a little bit, um, the way that I think about neural arts or neural aesthetics is this convergence of multiple fields. And so we think about the arts and culture and aesthetic experiences, but also um, technology is a really important partner and health, public health and science. And at the intersection really lies this incredible sweet spot that we are calling neural arts. And like any field, we're very interested in understanding a broad range of areas of weight, what I call ways of knowing. And so the work that we do at Hopkins, but also the work that we're doing with neural arts and others around the world is something that really incorporates many ways of knowing. So the neurophysiology and the neurobiology of the arts is really important. And it's, you know, as you'll learn, it's only been in the last 20 years that we've really been able to get inside our heads to really understand the way that these uh, arts experiences, sensorial experiences, change us structurally and functionally from a, from a neurotransmitter and neurophysiological perspective. But artists have always known the power of the arts and storytelling, visual arts, dance, movement, music, and all of the other ways that we think about creative expression value, it's so valuable in how we sort of bring this work forward from a, as a translational field. And certainly people with lived experience is also very critical to this work as is um, indigenous culture and others that have really uh, experienced and worked in this, in this area for millennia. So at our lab, we really work in four different buckets. And just to give you a little bit of information about that, um, we do quite a bit of research in both basic and translational work. We're very interested in dissemination and scaling. And we see this work as really being about the whole person, not only about mental health, not only about physical health or flourishing or learning, but really how does this work really um, resonate through all of the moments in our lives, but through all these kind of categories or silos in some ways that we've created. We're also very interested in field building. And I'll talk a little bit more about that with the Neuro Arts Blueprint. And then we've been doing quite a bit of work in community development and building the community locally in Baltimore, uh, around the country, and also around the world. And then also doing quite a bit of work in outreach and education. So this is a model that we created with about 40 different researchers, practitioners, people with lived experience that came together in 2016 to really start to think about how do we study the arts and aesthetic experiences in service of this idea of translation. And I wanna just talk about it for a moment because I think it's important, um, it's different than basic science or theories of change in learning or the, or the way that we think about studying things. I've always thought of this work as solution science. And so we start by really understanding what problem we're solving for. Um, and then we move into what I like to think of as uh, a collaborative discovery, a literature review for those of you that work in that space, but on steroids. And so what are some of the exemplars in other fields that might bring us back to this? What do we know about dance or what do we know about motor movement, for example, or some other kinds of fields that we might not have thought to bring to a problem? Knowing all of that, what might our hypothesis be? How might we study it? How might we refine that study? Ultimately to what do we know? And if we know something that we can share, how do we disseminate and scale that? And we've just recently added a ninth step to this process, which is evaluation. You know, How do we know it's working and how can we make it work better? And we love the spiral because this idea of a spiral means that you're gonna come back and do it again because we're always learning in this circular motion where uh, the spiral may be moving in an upward motion, but we're coming back to refine the work that, that we're doing. And what's also important about this model is it's an interdisciplinary model. So we bring people from all these different fields together 
against a single problem. So we all have a common goal of solving the problem, but we're looking at it from, from different points of view. And we've used this in many of the research projects that we've done at the lab. And also we have exported this model to other universities who are also using it as a way to uh, think of a framework on how you think about studying arts or aesthetic experiences in a generative way that can have translational uh, application in any sector. Um, and by that, I mean healthcare, education, uh, public health, um, at home, and all of the places where we might want to bring this work forward. So this is an example of just some of the projects that our lab has done over the last several years. And I'm sharing it to illustrate that the wide range of problems we're solving for are immense, as are the intractable issues that um, I think our world faces. And so we've done work in looking at music intervention uh, around serious mental illness to work we're doing right now with set and setting in a psychedelic experience. Um, or without a psychedelic experience and using different arts to help um, someone move into a transformational space. We've used this model to look at virtual reality and looking at virtual reality for creativity. Uh, interesting project we did several years ago, it was a five-year study working with seventh and eighth graders in a project called the One Book, where seventh and eighth graders read a book each year over the five-year period, and then talked about how narrative, how, how creative fiction helped them move into another uh, way of being, trying on a character, trying on different decisions that could be made. And so we use fiction and self-expression to help children both see themselves differently, but also think about the implications of what they might be able to do. And the first two years, we used um, books that were around gun violence in urban communities with authors that uh, the, the youth would be familiar with or could relate to. So we had a book called Long Way Down uh, by Jason Reynolds, which is an extraordinary book about a young boy whose brother's murdered uh, in gun violence in an urban community. And this young brother has to make a decision about whether he's going to avenge the death of his brother through killing, or he's gonna make a different decision. And the book goes back and forth between floors, um, which is the long way down in a subsidized housing program. And at the bottom of the, of the, the ride, he makes a decision. And so these youth are able to begin to see that there are other choices and hit pause to that moment between um, uh, uh, action and, and reflection. And so we were able to study that very consistently over the five, last five years to see how that worked by using literature, by using resources like that, and then having children create art. Um, so there's lots of examples that really tie back to this uh, impact thinking model. Another thing that our lab is very interested in is space. Our donors always been very interested in space and this idea of how physical space and virtual space can really change us and how we change it. And last year we had our first intentional spaces gathering where we brought together 300 people from different sectors that have an interest in space, whether that is as the builder, the architect, the interior designer, the researcher who's studying space um, or the client. And we did a re really interesting research project where we were able to uh, collect qualitative information about the state of the field and where the field needed to go. And I share that because the work in neural arts is further along than that, but the work in a new field has always has to be putting your ear to the ground to really hear all of the stakeholders. And so we're, working in this intentional spaces work, which I consider to be a subset of neural arts to really be able to help move that space along. And then we're also very interested in mental health. And we're doing a nationwide project right now on creative youth mental health, where we are working with youth voice. One of the things that we think has been missing for a long time is the voice of the youth. And so there's a great public health saying that says, nothing for me without me. And so we are working in five cities around the country to first uh, develop a youth advisory board and then youth gatherings to really hear how youth feel about 
where the resources are for them and also what they need and using art as data to begin to start to really understand beyond language, how the arts and aesthetic experiences and culture are really important for youth to practice to address daily stresses, daily anxiety, and also to think about it more broadly around diversity, inclusion, um, neurodiversity, and, and also serious, serious mental illness. So the blueprint, which is part of our field leadership, Mary Jo mentioned, uh, the blueprint was started in 2019 when the Aspen Institute and I came together to discuss this idea about was the field and all of the people that were either researching the arts or actively involved in using the arts in service of a community, uh, was this group of people who were everywhere, but really nowhere in the sense of being connected, was it right, was it time to bring these people together, to bring all of these folks together all over the world? And was there an appetite for policy and significantly greater funding in this space and a way to coalesce and come together? So what we heard was a resounding yes. And over the last several years now, we've been working to really build this field. And so the sort of North Star here is to ensure that the arts and in and, and all of its forms um, are become part of mainstream education, medicine, and public health. And that has been uh, something that is easier said than done, but has been an extraordinary uh, journey with lots of small and lots of big gains in it. And we're we're really seeing this work not just excel, not just expand, but the work in the neuro arts is really accelerating at an unprecedented state. Um, I used to say, you know, my work was pushing the boulder up the hill, and now I'm really chasing the boulder. And that's a really incredibly exciting place to be. So just to give you a little bit of information about the blueprint, uh, and you can go to, uh, let's see, www.neuroartsblueprint.org and you can see the entire blueprint. There's a really great executive summary, but a lot of collateral materials as well, if you're interested in learning more. But the bottom line for the blueprint was five recommendations. And the first, importantly, was to strengthen the research foundation for the neuro arts in all of the different sectors where we do research. So that's basic, but also applied research, public health research, qualitative and quantitative research. Secondly, to honor and support the many arts practices that promote health and well being. And that can range from a muralist in a city who's working in a community to um, someone with a PhD that's doing using creative arts therapy for very specific reasons, to neurologists that are using this work for Parkinson's or stroke to um, a wide range of psychologists, um, social workers, community workers, uh, you know, educators. So the, the amazing array of people that use the arts in their toolkit to help whatever work they're doing is quite extraordinary. And the importance to really honor and support uh, the arts practitioners is really huge. The third is to expand and enrich educational and career pathways. And that comes full circle to looking at diversity and equity and inclusion, um, advocating and for sustainable funding and promoting effective policy. And we always think that they go hand in hand. It's that when you have effective policy that addresses the need for sustainability, and that can mean federal money, it can mean a more global response, it can mean sector-based uh, kinds of policies and funding so that in education, in healthcare, getting healthcare providers to, to offer more support and acceptance of the neural arts as another form of intervention in these different areas. Uh, it also can include municipalities. Uh, I was recently at the NEA where we were talking about the fact that there's a lot of resources at play in, in our government that are earmarked for different things that are already exist. So what if we were able to look at some of those resources as assets for some of the work that's happening in neural arts? And that's happening in places like the Department of Defense, in the EPA, in NASA, in some of the different research areas like um, National Institutes of Mental Health. So there's quite a, a 
interesting opportunity to think about what do we mean by sustainable funding and expected policy. And then the last is building capacity, leadership, and communication strategies for all stakeholders across all these different sectors and across all of these different disciplines. So this is just one example of something that the NeuroArts Blueprint is launching this fall. Um, it is a resource center that I like to think of as a global watering hole, and it will invite anyone anywhere in the world who is doing this work in some way, whether you're an artist in a community, whether you're a researcher, a policymaker, a funder, an organization, um, a journalist, uh, whether you are a journal that is publishing peer review work or an association that has a journal and your members are being part of it. So the idea here is to bring everyone together where they can share what they do, because that's hugely important, and you can also find others and find information or resources that you need. So this resource center goes into beta in another month, and then it will be launched in this fall. And the idea is between now and the fall to really invite people to populate this so that when we launch it, we can really begin to use it in really robust really robust ways. Another project that the NeuroArts Blueprint is working on is called Community NeuroArts Coalitions. And these are hyper-local community coalitions all over the world that are bringing together researchers, practitioners, local policymakers, local funders, local institutions, whether they're cultural arts, civic, or educational, to be able to identify what are the issues happening in their communities and what is really important to really be able to turn to, to begin to help to support some of the very strong needs in the community through the lens of neural arts or neural arts practices, <clears throat> excuse me. And so this is actively happening now. Um, we have three neural arts uh, community coalitions. Um, one is in Kansas City, the other is New York City, and the third is Palm Beach. And we will be launching a toolkit in the fall that will allow any community anywhere in the world to begin to coalesce or to expand a, a neuro arts coalition that's already happening and also to be able to connect in a learning community with others. So another thing that the neuro arts is really excited about is we actually have gotten our first um, attribution um, in Congress to begin to be able to start to ask for additional funding in this space. And that's really important because without these kinds of appropriations with, at a national level, we're really not able to really move the ball forward and, and move the needle in significant ways. So this is the first time that the neuro arts has been listed in the congressional record. One other project that we're working on uh, that's very exciting is with AARP. So AARP has millions of partners and members all over the world, and they are launching something called Brain Health Action. And this is, a, this is an initiative with the goal of bringing shovel-ready practices to people 40 and above. And what's interesting to me is that AARP is continuing lowering the age. And I don't know if that's good or bad, but anyway, a lot more of us can actually be part of the AARP community. And what they really believe is that brain health and uh, mindfulness and this ability to change behavior or to build positive behavior starts younger and younger. And so they are they are building sort of an intergenerational model. But one of the things that we'll be doing here is providing practices that people can use immediately, listening to music, dancing, um, singing in the shower, all of the kinds of day-to-day -day things that we can do um, as we see things like social prescribing beginning to expand around this country and also um, already around the world. And so uh, the folks at AARP are really a great example of a partner that I think can really help to advance this work through agency and advocacy. And then we, uh, Mary Jo mentioned the book, Your Brain on Art. This is a book that for my co-author and I really was a love letter to, to the world about the value and the power of the arts. And so we interviewed over 120 people, scientists, artists, arts practitioners, many, many others who um, really had something to share. And our goal was to tell a story about 
the way that the arts change us in all of the ways that are so important in all of the different areas of our lives. And so the book is organized into categories like uh, mental well-being, uh, serious mental illness, learning, uh, community building, flourishing, and then really what does the future look like if we adopt this work and the science continues to grow, how does this really become something that becomes part of um, the ethos of humanity? And I think both Ivy and I believe that for probably many of the right reasons, we've done a lot of the wrong things to really make our work and our daily lives so transactional as opposed to transformational. And I think coming out of COVID, we literally are in some ways coming back to our senses and really understanding what is really meaningful to us. We learned that uh, through the book coming out and I, Mary just said it, it's a New York Times bestseller, but it became a New York Times bestseller in six days. That doesn't happen to books on art. And our publisher believes that the reason that happened was because the world is really hungry for something different. And what we've heard since the book came out is that the book has validated what many people already knew, what their deep, deep belief systems were, but they didn't feel like they had permission to be able to live an artful life. Uh, we've also seen the book being used to develop curriculum, to develop policy. Teachers are using it in their classrooms. Um, we're seeing it really become a tool in a way that we could never have envisioned. Um, and we're really just super excited because I think we are at a precipice where building meaning and purpose and hope is really the next chapter in, in humanity. And, and we're seeing that showing up literally all over the world. And as I said earlier, in, in every sector. So what Mary Jo said about standing on the verge of a cultural shift resonates with me so greatly. I think we are really moving this work so dramatically forward for many of the reasons I shared, but I'll share some others in terms of the science that is really allowing this work to um, take off in, I think, ways that we could never have imagined. So the arts, as we thought of them, you know, are really vast. And, you know, we're seeing new art forms being developed all the time. Uh, I think digital arts and immersive arts are allowing things to be expressed in ways that we've never seen before. But on an analog um, sort of level, I'm also seeing many, many kinds of art forms and genres and cultural influences address what needs to be shared. And so Ivy and I define arts, and I think it's a def definition that is really starting to move forward is creative expression. And creative expression can be gardening, right? It can be um, how we cook. It can be in architecture. It can be in all of these different ways that we move through our lives. And so one of the things I really invite people to do is think about how do you express yourself? How do you creatively share your voice? Um, how do you find that voice and how do you share it? And, and then ultimately, how do you celebrate it? And, and that's something that comes back to this idea of transformation and transcendence and, and really moving into that space. So this next um, slide just has resonated with me for a long time. It really comes back to this idea that, you know, this idea of arts is not new. It's something that we um, have known about and have been doing for millennia. Uh, it turns out that in writing the book, Ivy and I had an opportunity to meet with a number of indigenous cultures. And what we learned is that there are still over 5,000 indigenous cultures around the world who are using these creative expressions in their daily lives. And what's interesting is many of them don't have a word for art because it is how they are. It is how they live. And I think we've created some words in our in our culture and Western culture in particular, where we sort of define something and then put kind of constraints around it. And the arts are certainly one of those things. You know, uh, the arts have come to be to known as something that if you're not good at it, you shouldn't do it. And that has huge implications for us. So this is a Colombian cave painting that I think um, is quite extraordinary. And this is a painting or, or sorry, a um, quilted uh, stitched piece that was done quite recently by a group called Common Threads Project. 
Common Threads Projects works with women who have been um, sex trafficked or have experienced domestic violence or other kinds of atrocities. And they use these symbols to represent their daily life, what's not good, but also what is good. And if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, you can see this idea of home as a place to find solace and to, to reground themselves. And so there's a lot of things happening in this image, um, but we also see both strife and hope. And these are the ways that we have been using metaphor and symbol throughout millennia. This is an image um, of a piece of uh, found art, rock art by David Zhang in Tibet. And it's believed to be 226,000 years old. And if you look closely, you can see these hand imprints. And I think there's also a foot imprint. What I wanna point out is that these are the very same tools that we still use today to create our world. Um, you know, humans are both makers and beholders, and we have been since the beginning of time. So another person we were able to interview in the book uh, was E.O. Wilson. E.O. Wilson uh, was a really extraordinary evolutionary biologist at Harvard. And he made the point to us that these aesthetic experiences that we get through sensorial experiences are the gateway to transformation and transcendence and that they were and are essential for our species to evolve. And so the only way that that can happen is through our senses. And I want to just level set for a moment about our sensory mechanisms. You know, we have these extraordinary systems that we're born with, um, and they're exquisitely honed to your body, to your exact body. And, and they're there to really help you navigate the complexity of the world and to bring it in. And so just a couple of uh, what I like to think of as amazing facts is that in a single hour, you'll process over 34,000 different pieces of information visually. Um, over your lifetime, you'll process more than 25 million different images. On each of your fingertips, you have over 3,000 touch receptors, and your whole body has over 4 million receptors. And these receptors rapidly release neurotransmitters when they move through your body and brain, including things like serotonin and dopamine. So you have an instant reaction to these touch receptors coming through the thalamus to the somatosensory cortex to tell you what you're feeling. Um, your nose can detect a trillion odors with over 400 types of scent receptors. And those scent receptors in your nose renew every 30 to 60 days. So you're constantly renewing your system to bring the world in in fresh and new ways. And you know, we now know that uh, researchers are discovering that we have as many as 50 senses. And those senses are doing things like helping us know how we feel, helping us think about how we balance and move through space. But the takeaway here is that we believe that is essential that we come back to our senses if we're really going to expand our capabilities as human beings. So this is a quote that I love. Um, it's by Jill Bolte Taylor. And it says, most of us think of ourselves as thinking creatures that feel, but we're actually feeling creatures that think. And I think to illustrate this, um, I wanted to tell you a bit about an experiment exhibition that Ivy Ross and I did in Milan in 2019. And this was a demonstration um, to really show the impact of design on our biology and our well being. But I think it illustrates this idea about what Jill Bolte Saylor said. Uh, so we were able to put the idea of sensory perception and the effects on the body in an event called A Space for Being. And it was a collaboration with Google, my lab, and also um, Suchi Reddy, who is an architect and a, and a design company named Muto. And you'll see a little bit of their work in a moment. And so what we were able to do was design a band um, that fitted on each of the participants that had sensors. And those sensors continuously took biological information, including body temperature, variable heart rate, and pulse. And um, as those bands were fitted, we asked people to move into different spaces. So the participants were invited to touch, smell, listen, explore for five minutes in each of three different rooms. 
but we ask them not to talk, not to take photographs and not to use their devices. So to be radically present for five minutes. And just to think about that for a second, we very rarely do that. So just the act of being present allowed them to really bring in all of these different experiences. In each of the rooms, um, we designed a different set of neuroesthetic principles. So we use things like color, texture, materiality, lighting, shape, music, and we even developed a scent for each room. So you could really embody the space and, and really allow the space to come in you and also to you, you to really be in the space. And at the end of the experience, um, guests had their bands removed by a band tender and their data was downloaded for them only. And after we downloaded, we, we deleted it. So we weren't able to study this afterwards um, as an aggregate, but we were able to share with each of the participants what each of the rooms was showed that was happening in their bodies. So they could see a personalized visualization to reveal in each space where their bodies felt most at ease or most relaxed. And the conclusion was based on real-time biological information that was fed into an algorithm that we developed. So, so we knew when you see those bursts, that's where there's activity. That's where someone was really stimulated in some form. And when it's quieter around the rim, like you can see in that first room, it was pretty quiet. They were, they were, they were sort of at ease. They were feeling kind of comfortable within their space. What we learned was over 56% of the people um, said that the room that they liked best was not the room, was not the room that their bodies felt most at ease. And so what this experiment was really showing us is what Jill Bolte Taylor was saying is that because we're so active and because we're moving so fast and because we're getting so much information all the time about what we should like and what we don't like, we don't often let our bodies regulate and speak to us and tell us what it is that does work for us and, and what we need to really be our fullest, wholest selves. So that brings me to uh, just to sort of come back to this idea of neurosthetics. And this is really where I wanna talk just for a couple minutes about what do we know about the way the body does work in this space. Um, and as Mary Jo mentioned, um, this work is really the study of how arts and aesthetic experiences measurably change our brains and bodies and how this work is translated into practice to advance health, well-being, learning, community development, and so much more. And as I stated earlier, I can't underscore enough the vital importance of this being highly interdisciplinary. And so I thought this was a great chart and I wanted to share it with you. You know, when we think about what's in the pantry, what are the ingredients that we're working with when we think about how we're gonna study the arts in some form, uh, this is an amazing palette of things to choose from. And, and I think, as I said earlier, this is growing all the time, but you just get a sense of, you know, if this was a periodic table or if this was a list of chemicals that a pharmacological you know, um, company was using, I think of the arts as ingredients and as really important um, uh, elements that we're able to, to bring to bear. And that's really how the field is beginning to start to think about this in the way that we're, we're moving forward. So, this this is just a kind of you know screenshot for you, but I think it's really important to say that the arts alter a complex physiological network of interconnected systems. And I want to underscore like nothing else. Simultaneously, the arts are activating all of these systems in your body, your respiratory system, your circulatory system, higher brain orders, neural systems for sure, but also many physiological systems and also activating immune and endocrine systems. And so, you know, if you think about any of the kinds of uh, experiences or treatments, um, you know, there's, I think it would be hard pressed to find something that actually activates all of these circuitries at the same time. And the reason for that is because you are wired for the arts, you're wired for neuroesthetics. Um, you know, we are born with a hundred billion neurons and they connect at a synaptic level. And you have quadrillions of connections in your brain creating endless neural pathways. The way that these neurons connect is through your senses. So you're bringing the world in in all these miraculous ways, but it's the, it's the way that the synapses 
connect to each other and to other neurons that really allows us to build these neural pathways and ultimately these connections. And these pathways underlie everything that you do. So your movements, your memories, your, your emotions, you know, without neuroplasticity that is quite fluid, as we know, very active in early childhood, we're not able to really commit, create the connections that allow us to have resiliency, to have the kinds of decision making or divergent thinking or all of the other ways that our brains need to connect for health and well-being. And so just to uh, illustrate a quick example of this, in the 60s, uh, Marion Diamond was a researcher who, uh, a neuroscientist who uh, was very interested in enriched environments. And ultimately, I would say, is one of the first people that really understood neuroplasticity. And what she found was that in an experiment with rats, she created three different scenarios. One was an enriched environment. So for a rat, all the cool novel things that a rat would want, like wheels and color and different kinds of food, but novelty and surprise. Then she created a, a, a container that was status quo, what they were used to. And then the third was what she called an impoverished environment. And in that space, what she learned, um, what she had was basically bare minimum, just almost not enough to really stay alive. In just two weeks, she sacrificed the rats and what she found was that the rats in the enriched environments, brains increased in structure. So physically got bigger. The, the, the cerebral cortex got bigger by 6% in just two weeks. What she found in the status quo is that things stayed the same. And what she found in the impoverished environment was that the brain got smaller. And so we're now seeing that the the impact of enriched environments, sensorial experiences have huge implications on brain development and the developing brain uh, across the lifespan. And, um, and that's now being, we're now able to, because we're non-invasively able to look inside the brain, we're able to see this in humans. And the implications I think are really extraordinary. Um, this is an image that's in the book that just gives you some sense of the way that the brain um, is structured. And I just want to spend a moment on this. Uh, you know, you could not possibly take in all of the experiences that your senses are giving you in an hour, in a day, in a month, in a year. You know, it's zillions of experiences. But what your brain can do is, is filter out, and it does this exquisitely, filter out what's important to you, either for practical reasons or emotional reasons. And there's a part of the brain um, that's now being called the um, saliency network. And it's towards the front of the brain. You can see it represented in kind of a orange color. And it's it really, it's, it's a region. And what it does is capture the information that's really important for you to be able to activate and to be able to act on. And so there are, too interesting. So for example, with attention, we know that you can't attend to everything. And we, we now know that children that are um, young children, sort of two to three years old, can attend to like three to five minutes. Five-year-olds can attend to 15 to 20 minutes and 10-year-olds can attend to 30 to 50 minutes. Um, you know, adults can't really attend to um, much more than that. And so we put ourselves in these situations where we're asking people to attend to much greater experiences, but from a saliency experience, we can't, we can't hold that information. And so I think that has implications for learning and education dramatically, but also how we think about our work life and our day life and how we're really thinking about what's coming in, what we're holding and there's a part of the, 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 there's a system that's been identified as the central executive network. And that is how you bring information in. And then there's another network that I wanna share with you called the default mode network. And this is uh, what researchers are calling the neurobiological basis for self or sense of self. And it's really where we daydream, we mind wander, we really move through different, um, ways of talking to ourselves. But the key to the default mode network is that in order for the default net network, the default mode network to go online, you have to pause. You can't be bringing in the outside world. And it turns out that music, listening to music can provide um, that kind of pause, depending on the music, um, sort of that kind of quiet sound or quiet or just not being 
actively bringing in the world allows you to move into this default mode network space. And without it, we can't consolidate our thinking. We can't build identity. We can't build character. We don't know sort of who we are because we haven't had that kind of internal dialogue. And so this is a really important kind of system that thinking about what we bring in and how we process it becomes essential when you think about um, amplifying human potential. And just to take it one step further, this is a, a, a theoretical model by Anjan Chatterjee, who's an extraordinary neurologist and neuroscientist at University of Penn. And he and colleagues uh, talk about this idea of three concentric circles that come together to create a peak aesthetic experience. And the takeaway here is that uh, your knowledge, meaning your expertise, your context, and your culture are yours. Um, no one is going to be exactly like you. The way that you bring in the world and your sensory motor experiences are also uniquely yours. Emotional valuation, what you find um, is important, what you reward, what you long for, what you want, which ties back to the default mode network, is also highly individual. So as you bring these three uh, different domains together, at the center is your unique aesthetic experience. And a second takeaway here is that the more salient that experience is, the more you're gonna remember it and the more it becomes part of your autobiographical memory and how you uh, collect, restore, sorry, store and retain information. So um, what I, when I think about this field increasingly, I think about what I like to talk about as the elephant in the room. Um, the arts are ancient, they're powerful, um, they're, they're omnipresent, they're everywhere as we just talked about. But secondly, it, depending upon where you touch the elephant for whether that's for child development, whether it's for creative aging, whether it's for a disease and disorder, whether it's for mental health, whether it's for focus or attention, all of these different things, you're gonna touch a different part of the elephant. And that means you're gonna be touching a different art form potentially, or a different way of using the arts in service of what you're looking for. The other thing I think about with this slide is that, um, you know, the. Elephants are endangered. And I think if we don't really nurture the arts, they can go away. And at great, I think, despair and peril to us individually, but also from a sort of humanistic point of view. So I want to, in moving towards a close, I want to just lift up five kind of key takeaways for this conversation. And the first is that we have the proof. In any field, you always need more evidence. And so I'm not at all suggesting that we have all of the proof, but we have thousands of studies. And NIH is also doing um, significant amount of work in lifting up music, which is the most studied art form. And they have now developed a toolkit for researchers to um, begin to create better standards for how to study the arts. Um, around the globe, there are many university partners who are studying the arts in lots of different ways from epidemiology to um, applied studies to um, long-term longitudinal studies. And so what we do know is that there's a growing evidence that the arts and aesthetic experiences are advancing well-being. They're fostering social cohesion. They're amplifying learning. They're supporting and reducing um, stress and anxiety in very meaningful ways um, through different art forms. They're building resiliency in so many other ways. And so I'm just going to kind of walk through a couple of examples of that. Um, on this slide, you can see just some of the studies, very recent studies that have um, really begun to to um, guide the way we're thinking about ways to use the arts in the health arena. So we know, and this is sort of at a very high level, that the arts can enhance mental health, lower risks of depression, they can increase positive health behaviors, and also reduce adverse behaviors, reduce loneliness, promote healthy aging, and also provide what I think is really important as a protective and preventative effect as, as something that is as equal to weekly exercise. And so we're seeing studies that are showing lowering dementia, risk of dementia by as much as 40%, uh, reducing chronic pain, also lowering risk of disabilities, and also lowering risk of depression, to just name a few. 
Uh, we're also seeing uh, places like first responders using the arts for managing what could be PTSD, but chronic exposure to traumatic situations. We're seeing it be used for PTSD and ongoing trauma and many other examples. This is a slide that that, slot, that shows a little bit more about how the arts are being used in a learning environment. And some of these are just staggering. You can see that the arts increase synapses and gray matter, which supports cognitive skills. You can also see that um, youth engaged in arts stay in school longer, lower drug use, make better use of deci and decision making across the lifespan. Um, and so many other sort of extraordinary examples of how using the arts in general um, for learning can really uh, be tremendously valuable to build the kinds of divergent thinking and cognitive skills that are really critical. And I was talking to um, a researcher this week named Nina Krauss, and I said, you know, what I love about the arts is that they transfer to other areas in your, in your life. And she said, you know, respectfully, I, I'd like to change your thinking on that. They don't transfer they're already there. And what we need to be doing is building those skills, building those already existing uh, skills that the arts provide because they show up, they are already there. And the question is whether we're actually enhancing them and practicing and using them. And she used an example, she studies music. She used a, used a brilliant example of, um, I believe it was youth who both had been exposed to music and hadn't been exposed to music and how they were able to hear specific tones in language because they had heard music, because their ear was being tuned to hear more. So it wasn't that it was transferring to language, it was there. And I think that's something that we, we need to think more about as well. Uh, this is a slide that just uh, speaks to um, this idea that I mentioned earlier in that with you, with all of us, I think we've been told that if you're not good at it, you shouldn't do it. So by the time you're in third grade, most of us stop making art. Um, there was a great NASA study that showed that when you are um, below five, most of us would test as a genius. In fact, 98% of us would test as genius level, meaning you can think of different ideas that you have divergent thinking. By the time you're in third grade, it drops significantly to under 20%. And by the time you're an adult, it's less than 3% of the population. And so we are literally programming genius out of us by not being able to do these kinds of creative things that are so part of our DNA or so part of who we are. Um, this is just a, a, a slide and um, that talks about doodling. You know, we've often said, you know, don't doodle, it's not good to doodle, but it turns out that doodle activates the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that really helps us focus and, and actually find meaning in sensory information. So doodling or coloring or drawing stick figures actually increases the blood flow and triggers feelings of pleasure and reward. So we like to doodle. And it turns out that doodling um, versus non-doodlers uh, the doodlers are more analytical, they retain information better, and are better focused than non-doodlers. And so, I don't know, I think we should have a big um, momentum around, around just doodling. And, um, and if you're not doodling now, doodle, doodle away. Uh, music is another extremely valuable art form and sound. And just a couple of points about this area. You are over 60% water. So music and sound is vibration. So music and sound comes into your body as fast as three milliseconds. You instantly feel sound and music, and it has a tremendous opportunity to be used in ways that can really support health and well-being, and, and even learning in terms of being able to calm the nervous system. So, you know, using things like tuning forks or singing bowls, those are some of the kinds of tools that can be used that really amplify that. Um, we also know that um, playing music um, at any age continues to increase synaptic connection and also build the gray matter that we talked about earlier. But singing and humming also has an ability to activate the vagus nerve and that engages the parasympathetic system. So it helps you feel instantly calm and often able to focus. 
And we're also seeing things like moms using singing um, and holding their babies to release oxytocin and also creating um, bonds um, and reducing uh, postpartum depression. Uh, we're seeing lyrics that are positive, help children be more tolerant and empathetic and generous. And I think that's a really interesting point in a time where there's so much um, sharp language when you start to think about the role of positive lyrics to really change mood and outcomes and behavior. Um, and we also know that certain music decreases cortisol and increases oxytocin. And so there's some really beautiful work that's been done by Charles Lim over the last 10 years that looks at the role of music and other art forms in terms of improvisation. And I often like to say that improvisation, we're improving all the time, right? We're, as we're in conversation, we're improving all the time. And how could music help us to be better improvers in, in all, the, all the areas of our lives? Just a point about expressive writing that I think is worth sharing. You know, poetry is probably the oldest written language. And we know that expressive writing has a different kind of effect on us than other art forms. Um, there's been some beautiful fMRI work done and other biomarkers that show that when you are using expressive writing, um, you're lowering cortisol, but you're also lowering cognitive you're also reducing cognitive load. So in essence, you have more capacity to attend to other things. And we know that this ability to put words into, um, put, put words down on the paper allows us to sometimes express emotions and feelings that we have not been able to conceptualize. And this idea of finding a story and finding a narrative also helps us ultimately rewrite our stories and, and reshape the way that we've held memory. So it ultimately becomes very important for building things like identity and character. The second takeaway that I wanna share with you is that there is an art for that and there's places for the arts. And just to, you can see that everywhere. You know, the arts are not dependent on age, they're not dependent on resources and they're not dependent on ability. And they're also not a nice to have. And I, I just want to lift that up. Again, we are physiologically wired for the arts. And we see, when we start to see them show up everywhere, and I, I love this image because it's an image that takes, it's actually from Crystal Bridges in um, Bentonville, Illinois. And it's in nature. And I think just to say, nature is the highest art form and the most aesthetic. And so we take so many of our cues from nature because we are from nature. And so, you know, even 15 minutes in nature can change your physiology in a very positive way and in, in bringing you back to homeostasis and helping you focus better and regulating your respiration. And many other things have been shown around the, the role of nature. And, and that makes eminent sense to me. Um, Pottery, you use both sides of your, you use both hands in the same level of dexterity. And we're seeing that pottery actually uh, releases uh, oxytocin that immediately that makes you feel um, more relaxed. And it also reduces, it also releases serotonin. And just the act of using your hands in this way where there is no necessary outcome also helps to sort of reduce cognitive load. Handwork I mentioned briefly earlier. Uh, we're seeing students um, in colleges start knitting circles and uh, quilting circles and woodworking gatherings. They build help to build stronger connections. They maintain focus, and we're seeing this work reduce anxiety and manage stress. There's also a program called the Unlonely Project that's bringing hundreds of high school student counselors um, together to help use the arts for high school students. And we're also seeing this work show up in senior centers, whether it's handwork like this, or it's handwork like collage, or even um, simple kinds of drawing exercises. Dancing, um, dancing is uh, something that I say, if you only had one art form that you could do, I would write a prescription for dance because in just 15 minutes, stress has been seen to reduce anxiety, depression, stress. It releases endorphins, serotonin, dopamine, just to name a few. And it also allows us to sync with each other. And I think in an age where loneliness is an epidemic, 
and belonging is what we're thirsting. Dancing has the ability to instantly create this kind of synchronicity. And so um, we're seeing some really beautiful programs all over the world showing up where people are coming to together and dancing and in big and small spaces. I mentioned nature and just to reiterate that um, Nature is something that I think we don't often think of as an aesthetic experience, but it is ultimately the highest aesthetic experience. And this is a slide of, of a place called um, Sweetwater Foundation. And the point I wanna make here is anywhere, anytime, anybody, and, and, and as I mentioned, any art form. And again, this idea that um, this is a place on the south side of Chicago. It's a 10 block area where there used to be abandoned houses. And uh, Emmanuel Pratt, who's an urban planner, decided to reclaim this work, the space, and build a program where there are 10 acres of gardens. Uh, youth in the community come here. There's a woodworking shop. There is music and, and, and dancing and a farm, farmer's market twice a week. People see this as a community hub, a place to come together and a place to be. And it was literally built um, out of this desire to really bring people together in a safe environment where, where they can thrive. And so, and there are thousands of examples of this kind of, uh, he calls it uh, small growth. Um, and what I think is interesting is uh, this idea of small, so small is beautiful is the term. And I asked him one day I was visiting, I said, what do you mean by small is beautiful? And he said, um, if you have millions of these small places and they connect to each other, then you have a quilt, then you have a blanket that really covers the world with these very deep, rich, culturally honoring spaces that allow these arts and aesthetic experiences to grow. And so this idea of building a learning community around neural arts really resonates um, in the ways that these programs can happen. So small is beautiful. And I think sometimes we get caught up in this idea of scale, but redefining scale is something that I'm very interested in. The fourth is technology as a catalyst. And that's just to say that technology in the research, connect technology in the practices and technology for dissemination and scaling is something that um, really provides us with tremendous opportunities. And there are lots of examples of, of ways that uh, startups are beginning to use technology and these arts experiences to solve some really intractable problems, including looking at using technology for ADHD and having some FDA breakthrough um, awards for some of these kinds of aesthetics combined with technology to really advance some of these really difficult problems. And this is an example of a program, I won't spend a lot of time on it now, but it's called Chromasonics. And what they do is they developed a space, small space where you can enter and you can see color and hear, sorry, see sound and hear color. And what's extraordinary about it is you leave this space after only 15 minutes and it's as if your brain and your neuro, your nervous system have been sort of recalibrated. And then what it leaves you with is a kind of radical presence. And it's being studied now with neuroscientists to really understand what is happening neurophysiologically when you're really allowing your brain to bring in sensorial experiences, but not put them in a cultural context. So there's no musical instruments. There's no um, way to sort of anchor this to a memory. It's just a pure experience of sound sound and light. And so the last is change your lens, change your life. And what I wanna say here is that, you know, we don't have to shift the kaleidoscope very far to have a radical difference in how we view the world. And the work that I'm talking about with neuro arts is something that is accessible to us all now. We don't have to wait. And in the book, Ivy and I talk about something called the aesthetic mindset, which is four basic components. The first is curiosity, the ability to let yourself be curious. The second is playful exploration. How do you explore the world without, and this is important, without judgment and without an end product. And the third is sensory awareness. 
How do you feel what's happening around you in all these different ways we talked about? And then the third is an appetite for making and, and, and beholding to open yourself up to more of that and to be more aware of that in your daily life. So in closing, I'll just say, I love this quote and it really, for me, resonates so deeply with everything we're talking about that art is our one true language, global language. It speaks to the need to reveal, heal, and transform. It transcends our ordinary lives and lets us imagine what is possible. So with that, I will say thank you and looking forward to um, having a, a deeper discussion. Well, thank you so much, Susan. What an astounding talk. And I know you'll get a chance to look back over the chat. And and obviously your message resonated so deeply with people. Um, many, many questions have surfaced. And so I'm going to do my best to you know pick out some of the most um, salient. Lots of questions about how to get into this whole area of doing research on the neuro arts. And one question that somebody asked is, are there academic programs that you would recommend for someone to get into neuro arts research? It's, that's a great question. And I have not seen the, the chat. I'm looking at it now and I'm frankly blown away. <laughs> so, wow. Um, you know, this is why the neuro arts blueprint was created. And there is really not an easy path currently. Um, there will be, uh, but depending upon what you're interested in, um, it, so by that I mean, are you interested in uh, neurophysiological research, so neuroscience research or cognitive science? Are you interested in public health research? The, the best way to enter this space in the short term is to go to the field of study and to bring this work forward. Uh, there are several, we're, we're actually Johns Hopkins, we're launching our first undergraduate course in neuroaesthetics this fall. And we're really excited about it. We're gonna be working on a curriculum to have a degree granting program. Um, that'll take some time. Uh, there's a program called Goldsmith in London that has a neuroaesthetic program uh, that is a little bit more broader, you know, neuroaesthetics, applied neuroaesthetics is really what we're talking about here. And so you have to really figure out kind of where you want to sit. Um, but I, in the next month or so, the blueprint is convening 20 plus universities around the world who in some way are doing either research or doing all, one of three things, research, uh, practice, or education in this space. So and we're trying to we'll do an asset map and we'll push that out as quickly as we can of what are the educational opportunities. So, for example, is there a certificate that you could do? Is there one course that you could take? Is there a degree granting program, whether you're a researcher or a practitioner? And, and, and where would that be? And that will be as part of this resource center that I mentioned. But I think when I said earlier that the field is everywhere and nowhere, one of the most critical things is to create this pipeline for researchers and for practitioners in, in very clear ways. And so the research that I mentioned, there's thousands of studies, there are, but I often think about these studies as being um, sort of uh, garage research, meaning people had a big grant and then they said, and we're gonna do this. It's only been in the last five years that NIH has put about $35 million into researching the arts. And you can kind of get at it different ways. You can also have philanthropy be um, very supportive in, in doing work in this space. But in general, um, this has not been a well-funded research area. So, you know, you can see the creative tensions there. You need the funding in order to be in the field. You need the field to have the funding. And so I think that's coming. Mm -hmm. You know, Susan, I think you addressed that question so well because you've said throughout your presentation, this is an, an eminently interdisciplinary field. So literally from almost any academic discipline, from basic sciences to kind of applied health sciences to, you know, philosophy, the arts, any of these could be relevant backgrounds to bring to um, the neuro arts um, research. There's a whole bunch of questions about kids. And so one of the questions, um, you know, people are curious, have you worked with children and how might you expect children to be similar or different from adults in terms of their neurobiological interaction with aesthetic experiences? 
So my career started working with children um, and I, my, I actually started uh, working um, in the school of ed and looking at the arts for learning and child development. And then I moved, I was invited to come to the school of medicine because of the donor, the donor that we have there. And so I was always very interested in this idea around how children naturally understand the arts and creativity and aesthetic experiences. And, you know, if you, we just had a grandchild uh, now almost a year ago, and we've literally watched her brain wire up, right? We've watched her learn every single week and, you know, being exposed to um, age appropriate enriched environments that where is there is that serve and return. You know, there's a lot of research that says under two children should not be exposed to technology. And I think it's interesting because it is that physical three dimension that young children explore, right? They touch, they feel, they smell, they trial and error, you know, they, 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 they experiment with food. If you watch the way, you know, a child decides what tastes they even, or what textures feel comfortable to them. And so um, I think children are most many children, I should say, many children who are not in adverse conditions, not subject to impoverished communities where they're not getting enough food, not getting enough access to clean water, um, you know, a place that's reliable, that feels safe, um, are naturally doing all of these things. I think what I shared in terms of when we get to about eight, nine, and we start to be able to become a little more self-aware of how we're being seen in the world, we start to shut down. And so we start to lose this capacity that we have because we're ashamed often, we're discouraged, we don't see the value of what of doing that. And so if you're not, you know, and, and there's a fabulous program came out of um, Venezuela called El Sistema. Many communities have adopted it uh, using music, playing music together, children finding their instrument, playing together. Um, there's been great studies, fMRI studies showing that uh, that kind of experience, and it doesn't have to only be music, but in this case, it is music, is helping kids build stronger relationships, synchronize with each other. Uh, be more resilient, make better decisions, do better in school at large. Yet at the same time, we are taking art out of schools, which is, is mind boggling to me. I mean, it absolutely just it doesn't make any sense. And we're not only taking it out of schools for enrichment, um, we're taking it out of school for mental health. We're taking it out of school because kids learn better. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of tying kids' hands behind their backs and saying, you know, run a hundred miles. It's it's it really is so limiting. And there are a lot of states around the country that are working really hard to bring arts back into schools, especially California. They have a Proposition Twenty Eight that is a billion dollars a year that goes to bring art teachers back in the schools. And right now they're trying to operationalize that. But you know, I think. It is essential. Tomorrow, I'm going to meet with the folks of um, the National Arts Educator Association, who also are under the gun because arts educators, that field is is not growing the way it needs to because the jobs aren't there, and the compensation isn't there, and so it's but it's exactly the right place where we should be, um, for adults in terms of the role of the arts. You know, we know neuroplasticity is strongest when children, when, when we're in childhood, but it does not stop across the lifespan. And so, you know, and it, and it shouldn't stop in the middle years. You know, a lot of times we talk about creative aging and child development, but those middle years are really important. They're our most productive years that oftentimes we let these creative expression experiences and practices go aside. And there's beautiful work showing that when you actually are engaged in these art forms as maker or beholders, you're more innovative, you make better decisions, you're a better partner, you're a better collaborator at work, you can you can regulate your nervous system for the stresses and anxieties that are going to come our way. And so um, hopefully that gives you some insight on, on that. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful, Susan. You know, I really love this next question. It's com it's complex, I'll just say. Um, somebody writes that they're a neurophysiologist who loves the arts. 
And they're wondering, um, in your opinion, how do you get someone who has never been interested in arts interested in arts? What kind of simple projects would you introduce? And and somebody else has, you know, was writing in chat, we need to get legislators and educators and school boards. And so it's a broader question, you know, than just getting a person. I mean, how how do we get this message forward? And especially with people who maybe arts isn't even on their radar. Well, I think the word arts gets in our way, first of all. Um, you know, the minute you say, let's do art, you can feel people kind of backing away. Um, I was on a podcast once where I said, you know, dance is the most extraordinary. He goes, I would never dance. I hate to dance. And I said, well, have you ever, when was the last time you danced? And he said, when I was 12 and I was so embarrassed. And I said, well, do me a favor. Where are you? And he told me where he was. He was in a room by himself. And I said, stand up and just move your arms. Just move your arms. You know, just like, just pretend like you're dancing. Play with, play with me. And he laughed so hard and it was amazing because um, he was like, well, I never do this in public, but this feels really good. And so my first piece of advice is don't frame it as an art experience. Um, ask somebody to do it, to draw something, draw how, how they feel or draw to a piece of music. That's always, a, that's always really interesting. You start to kind of see this connection between how music makes you feel or dance in your living room, um, you know, make a creative meal together, um, you know, do, do things, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, singing in the shower, singing in the car, you know, we all do those things. And I think it's finding an entry where you have the experience first and then you bring in the why it matters. Um, because, you know, I think theory and practice don't work in this order in this space. It's practice and then theory. And as soon as somebody does it, they get it. So in a couple of months, Ivy and I are doing something in New York and it's with it's the, this year for Ivy and I, this year is all about activating this work and the blueprints about activating the work. And so as an advocate, we're bringing together um, philanthropists and uh, uh, social impact funders, people that corporate leaders, people that can really move the needle. And we're asking them without giving too much away, um, we're asking them to have experiences and then we're gonna talk about why it matters. And in my work, that has been the way in um, and not judging it, but just having people have some experiences that they, and the way the book started, this is worth sharing. Ivy had a salon at her house when we first met. She's on the Luminary Advisory Board in my lab. That was how we first met. I invited her to be part of that. And we decided to do it kind of like a crowd, what do they call it, icebreaker, because people in the room didn't know each other. And so we asked this question, um, has the arts ever affected your life in any way? And three hours later, people were still telling their stories uh, about how art saved one of their children from um, uh, contemplating ending their life, how someone else had dyslexia, and they ultimately became a filmmaker because the, their mom said, you know, reading, you're not going to be a reader, but you're a visual person. And they started making film. Another person talked about architecture and how space really changed their lives. Everybody has that story. I, I tell a story about my sister who um, was in a really terrible farming accident. I'm a twin and she almost lost her leg. And I think I've told Mary Jo this story before. And as a result, um, my sister couldn't talk about it because the BRCA region in her brain shut down. And I couldn't, I would, I was 12. I, I, I didn't know what was happening. She didn't know what was happening. But my mother suggested that she start to draw just to pass the time. And what was happening is my sister was getting things out that she couldn't express in words because there were no words, but she had metaphor and symbol. And then I could understand her. And so I think that's why I'm here. I think that's why I'm here right now because of a tragedy that helped me understand there are other ways to communicate that were actually maybe better than words in almost every circumstance and to help me feel it, not think it. So um, I, that was that's what I would suggest. Mm -hmm. Give people experiences. Don't just talk about it, but give them experiences. And you all are artists. I bet all of you are artists, you know, all yeah. of you are thinkers in some way. 
So Susan, there's, you know, other really interesting questions um, that talk about the connection between shrines and um, public art and art museums and, you know, the potential there. You know, at the University of Minnesota, we are really so fortunate to have quite a, we have a very rich arts community um, around us, you know, throughout our entire state. And on campus, we have so many researchers and clinicians interested in this area. We're actually um, starting mapping in creating our own neuro arts network just to find out who on campus is doing research in this area. And I think I mentioned to you, we actually had 90 people self-identify that they were interested in the neuro, the neuro arts. Um, Wiseman Art Museum is an art museum on campus and they have really decided as part of their mission, they want to be a place not where people come and observe art, but actively interact and experience um, art. And so later this month, um, we're creating um, the, Molly Sturgis, who leads um, our um, sort of immersive arts area, is creating, an, um, a, we call it the Waking the Oracle, kind of a project um, interacting with actually an art exhibit on campus. So just want to sort of share that as kind of another example of, you know, interaction with an art, with a museum who's actually really rethinking its mission in such mm -hmm. a creative way. You know, the um, AAM, which is the American Association of Museums, I think something like that, they're going to be convening in Baltimore this year. And I and the curator, or the, I guess she's the director of the museum, the Baltimore Museum of Art, are the co-leads for the Baltimore uh, Advisory Group. And Maria Rosario Jackson, who is the head of the NEA, Renee Fleming, Terry Friedman, who runs the um, Reginald L. Lewis Museum, and I are doing a, a conversation. And you know, I, I love it because it's talking about, in this case, women leaders who are doing some really extraordinary things in each of their spaces. And I think that museums around the world are re-evaluating and evolving their missions and their roles, both people coming to the museum and, and taking the museum and the artifacts that serve as extraordinary triggers and catalysts for such great conversation. And so it's very exciting to hear how you know museums um, are intersecting in communities in different ways. And so I'm really excited about that, that conference. But these public spaces that that you that you mentioned you know, they have an opportunity to, I think, evoke conversation at many levels. And I was in, I was at the Federal Reserve last week, and there was a presentation by a group that's creating a arts corridor in Chicago. And the idea is to be able to literally spill out in this community and be able to find all of these different um, ways to experience arts, whether that's with food, so community table, to making experiences, to beholding experiences, but to do it in a way that feels part of everyday life. So, hey, there's a drumming circle. Somebody, somebody was just talking about drumming. I love, you know, inviting people to participate in these different, across generations. And so I think we're seeing community um, come together where university partners, other academic partners, um, cultural arts organizations, libraries, um, youth centers, uh, senior centers are all kind of meshing up and and for lots of different reasons. Um, but I think it's a really, it, it, make, it feels right to me. So there's many questions about different aspects of, of research, but a couple of questions um, focused on neurodivergent practitioners and participants in the and the question being, are there many studies that have included um, either neurodivergent practitioners or participants? So do you remember early on, I showed the impact thinking model and I said collaborative discovery. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that we built that step in is I was working on a project for children who um, had some kind of neurodiverse issue. And we were, we were actually trying to look at, um, in this case, children who were um, in um, in in some level of uh, of coma. They couldn't couldn't wake up, and 
we were trying to understand uh, what was had been studied about children in that space and the role of arts and spaces from the sensory point of view. And what we realized was that there was nothing there. But if you looked at uh, occupational therapy or you look at physical therapy, or if you actually looked at some of the work that was being done in Europe for different spaces um, in healthcare, we were able to find some information. And so the neurodivergent field, I think in education has, there's more work there, but for health and well being, I think there's been less and, and it's super important. Um, and so it's an area, um, I mentioned a program, Adam Ghazali, who is at UCSF, he runs something called Neuroscape. He's probably one of the leaders in the in the world on understanding um, uh, ADHD. And um, I believe he's also begun to done some work with autism. Kennedy Krieger at Hopkins has done quite a bit of work in looking at autism and the arts. Um, but it is it's it's not um it's not a deep bench, you know, there's there needs to be cons significantly more work there. Mm -hmm. So a question about AI, and it seems like with any topic, AI comes up, um, artificial intelligence, and what are your thoughts on AI arts in relation to your work? So I feel that technology in general is a really important part of the neuro arts world. It's one of the three circles. But you know, with AI, AI has the ability to um, interpret things in ways that fit quickly and in ways that we probably couldn't do, um, you know, in our lifetime. But AI is sensors, and we are sense sensory, and so I think that the 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 goal is to be able to figure out how we bring this highly sensorial world that we live in and need to live in more with these sensors that can help us understand and take off some of the things that we don't want to do, but to be able to help us understand things in 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 a very um, expeditious way sometimes. Um, I'll tell you an example of a of an AI project that I think is a, is a it, it, there's dangers in AI and I think there's a lot of caution and I think we need to be really careful. So I don't in any way say, this is a panacea and it's great it's here. But in this one instance, I was really moved by um, a study that was done within several, it was a small study, but there were several young people who were experiencing significant and long-term mental health issues. And the people around them didn't understand them. You know, they would say things like, you know, you have to try harder or, you know, it'll pass or, you know, all the things that we sometimes might say because we don't know what to say because we don't, we can't empathize because we're not there. And depression and mental health is a hard thing to explain. And so they, I think it was six people shared their feelings with AI and said, I would like you to create a piece of art that shows how I feel. And I want it to be in a, I'm making this up now in a um, Picasso style, or I want it to be more like a Van Gogh style, or I want it to be like a mural on a wall. And they were able to see themselves that were created by this AI experience. And then they brought their friends and family in to see it. And it was so emotional because it captured in a visual image what they couldn't explain. And some persons felt trapped, someone felt unseen. And so, I thought that was a beautiful example of how AI could help us in a way that I never could imagine, never could imagine. Incredible. Isn't that amazing? I know. And so, you know, I think it's, it's yes. And right. You can't say one good or bad. Yeah. It all depends on how it's used. Right. <laughs> Well, Susan, I just want to thank you for a remarkable um, hour and a half. It's such an honor to have hosted you today. And the conversation was rich. The questions, there were three times more questions to ask than I could possibly get to. The chat has been incredibly lively. And it's been really fun to see how 
supportive people have been of each other. So in addition to thanking you, I want to thank all of our University of Minnesota sponsors who are partners in bringing you um, today's lecture. And I also want to acknowledge and thank all of our staff at the Bakken Center, in particular Molly Buss, who helped make today's webinar possible. So thank you all for making this event so successful. Really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks and be well. Thank you. Bye-bye.